Okay, it looks like I've finally been put live, so <laughs> let's start now. Thanks very much for inviting me to share my analyst view of blockchain or distributed ledger technology. I use the terms interchangeably. I know they're not the same, but we're not here to argue that in 2020. I guess the reason I've been invited is because I've been around emerging technologies for over 30 years now and first picked up on this thing, enterprise blockchain in mid to late 2014. So I've been researching it for over two and a half years. And equally importantly, for this session, I've been working in depth with Forrester clients on their projects as well. So um, I have a reasonably good insight it's what in, uh, into what's going on in the ecosystem. Um, and what I would say is we've already seen the first inflection point in enterprise blockchain in that in, in the second half of 2018, we really started seeing a deflation of the hype bubble um, in that all those projects that were started in the hope of blockchain being this kind of magic potion or whatever you might want to call it, it became absolutely clear that no technology, blockchain or otherwise, could deliver against all of those promises. So that had already happened, that we were already transitioning into a phase where we were seeing mainly real projects, less, fewer headlines, but lots of real projects progressing nicely. And that looked like it was going to continue. And I think we may be having a little tech hitch here because I, it would be great if we could get onto my second slide. Wonderful. Thank you. It looked like that trend was going to continue. And then COVID-19 um, hit big big time. And so I often get asked, what's that mean now? What's that? Um, how's that impacting blockchain? And that's why I started with that. And it has and it hasn't got an impact. Yes, clearly one of the overall impacts of COVID-19 is almost instant digitization. And that in itself is likely to lead to an acceleration of certain blockchain projects. What it'll no, uh, no doubt also mean is a reduction in resources, uh, which in turn means no more speculative projects, but those have been wheeled back a lot anyway. R&D is continuing. I know that from my on, ongoing client conversations because companies where possible are investing in the future. But what is very clear is that any initiatives that continue really have to have merit. They have to have a clear benefit they have to map onto corporate goals um, such as around state sustainability or ethical principles or whatever. So it's going to be an acceleration for many projects and certainly those that are going strong already, they're not going to be stopped. But if we go on to the next slide, what I would also say, we really, really, really do not need any more POCs. We've proven that the technology can be made to work. It can do what it what, what we want it to do. And we have plenty of networks in production or at advanced pilot stage. So we don't need to prove that bit anymore. Yes, pilot projects are still useful, but they need to have a clear view to going to production as opposed to just noodling around with the technology. And we've seen some great examples of in-production systems as well already at this event. But I'll add a bit of a caution here as well, because the gap between a pilot project or a trial system to a fully operational system still remains quite wide. I have those discussions on a daily basis. And the challenges remain both on the technical and the non-technical side. Um, and that's partly of where we are in the cycle. It's still an emerging technology, but we still also see a number of misconceptions going on about blockchain. And so there's still an education need. And also what confuses enterprises a lot, I find in my discussions, is what I've heard Brian call the Cambrian explosion of blockchain frameworks. I've reviewed over 70 of the things. Clearly, that's too many. Um, um, more encouragingly, it's about a handful that have really crystallized and are standing out and gained traction in the enterprise. And indeed, a number of them are actually represented on this panel. 
But it's also clear, if we move on to um, the next slide, that blockchain on its own isn't enough. Firstly, the blockchain piece is only ever part of an end-to-end -end process. So you need to make it work together with other technologies. You need it integrated with your existing enterprise system, your ERP systems, whatever. That isn't going to go away. And there isn't nearly as much done as needs to be in, for example, automating and securing data transfer, but interoperability, whatever it may mean, has moved center stage more and more because we're getting more and more systems going live. And so what you're seeing is companies with, with a realization, hang on, um, I may need to be a participant in more than one network, or I have a process that actually touches a variety of networks. And then, of course, you also have that concern, have I banked on an underlying framework that may not develop in the direction in which I need it to develop? So we're seeing various trends there. And of course, when I say whatever it may mean, do you just want to um, pass messages? Do you want to transfer value? Do you want to interpret? at state level. We don't have time to go into that. But those discussions about how the technology will develop are very much at the forefront, including new ways of looking at things. For example, having um, separating the smart contract layer from the ledger layer, um, gaining scale by um, having the consensus separate from the ledger, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot going on at, at the tech front. But if we move on to the next slide, slide. I will also always stress, and at the risk of sounding flippant, blockchains are 80% business. And I venture to um, state that all those technology problems that people are working on and where sometimes a solution may not be as close as people would want to be, they will still be solved before the non-tech issues and ecosystem challenges will be resolved. Whether it's companies agreeing around data sharing, process definitions, um, ecosystem governance, and of course, um, you can't, in enterprise environments, you can't ignore regulatory requirements, antitrust legislation, whatever it may be. But where I'm seeing a lot of ecosystems struggle, in particular projects that have um, also got successful pilots going, how do you expand beyond that? How do you really go from an existing small network to a broader one, making sure that there's something in it for everybody? And that's where I see the biggest challenges when networks started with a valid use case, but without enough attention to making sure that really everybody gets benefit out of it. So we need to um, make sure that there is a lot of attention on that while we're working on those tech issues. And then finally, in closing, I will also just go back to what I keep saying. You know, yes, you need to think big. This is a revolutionary technology, and I don't use that term lightly. Um, but what is also absolutely clear that you need to start small for a variety of reasons. One is technology immaturity, but also simply because people, companies have trouble really getting to grips with changing things completely and changing them overnight. Yes, the current dynamics about around COVID-19, as I've mentioned, may have speeded some of that up. But what I'm seeing the most successful projects do, they're using concepts, leveraging concepts like tokenization. They're using smart contracts, but they're using them in, in ways that are not threatening. So we're still in that optimizing what we've already got and making it better. And that can have tremendous benefit. Otherwise, those networks wouldn't be allowed to keep going. But we're also laying the foundation to starting to do things completely differently by sometimes using technologies where people justifiably say, you don't need a blockchain for that. No, you might not. Not today. But without using those newer technologies, newer concepts, you will never get to that more collaborative way of working, that co-opetition that companies also need to learn about that really are the foundation for the process changes that we all need. And with that, I've no doubt way outstayed my welcome, but thank you for your attention anyway. Okay, thank you, Martha. Uh, Steve Cerveny, I'm, I'm going to pick it up uh, here with, with some, some of 
sort of drill down a little bit into um, what we're seeing at Kaleido um, and, and really, I think, reinforce some of, some of the points that uh, you were just making. Um, we see developers are, are, are learning how to build collaborative apps and, um, and, and new patterns are emerging. If you think about databases, in the beginning, everyone tried to just build app, apps directly into databases and it didn't work so well. And over time, we realized that um, you know, databases are really good at storing data, but business logic goes somewhere else. And so we, in, similarly, we've seen over the last few years with blockchains, um, you know, these, these apps that early apps that were built uh, on the chain, a, a lot of problems uh, were exposed uh, with that. And what, what we're now seeing in 2020 is a, a set of patterns that, that are really starting to harden um, that use blockchain in the appropriate way, the appropriate tool for the appropriate problem, if, if that makes sense. So things like uh, shared systems of record where there's transaction profiting, processing happening or proof stores um, where you can efficiently push hashes onto the chain. In fact, hashes and tokens <laughs> really are becoming the, the programming constructs that we see uh, with blockchains today. Uh, and then from a processes perspective, uh, that shared process engine. So how, how to effectively address that. And, uh, but a crucial element is going to remain getting value out, for getting value out of these projects, getting that balance right of not overloading the, the business logic, but sticking to some of these proven patterns. A, sec a second insight that we want to share for, for the state of, of enterprise blockchain today is just an introspection about decentralization itself. Um, our view or my view is that enterprises are still struggling with this as, as a concept. Um, and, and although there are some new insights, we, we now understand that decentralization isn't really one thing, but there are several distinct types of, of decentralization. And in fact, um, you know, building a consortium today in the enterprise world means figuring out uh, if, the, if these three things are sort of independent dials, where you, you set each dial to get the appropriate uh, business outcomes and, and benefits. Really quickly, physical decentralization, you know, we, we get that already. It's about broad participation in the network, but in the enterprise space, we see that there are trade-offs to that, you know, larger attack surface, um, you know, latency implications, and performance implications and so on. Uh, so we want enough decentralization, uh, especially in the core validator layers of our network, but you know, we recognize those trade-offs. Business decentralization really is more about disintermediation. That was a cool idea a few years ago, um, but it really is so much more than that. It's about our processes and how they map into um, our business ecosystem and, and doing that in, in ways that drive business outcomes. And then finally, transactional decentralization, which really is, in, in our view, the breakthrough um, in, in enterprise blockchain, the, and, and ensuring that you do this with privacy baked in, uh, because when you're executing a specific transaction, it's critically important that only the relative parties are participating in that. But for those parties, um, you want to execute this uh, once in sync and, and permanently store uh, that. So, so all of those things need to come together for, for um, you know, a comprehensive view on decentralization itself. Uh, the final insight that, that I want to uh, mention before I switch to more of an ecosystem lens um, is this concept of privacy. I wanna double click into that for a minute. Um, privacy really was a day one thing that, um, you know, when enterprise uh, blockchain, if, if you can think of it as a, a subcategory of blockchain at large, when that, that um, whole part of the family tree started, privacy was, was a pillar. Um, enterprises understood from day one that they needed privacy. Um, so it really is a corner, cornerstone for just about every project that we see today. 
Um, but we do see a, a whole set of, of technologies that are being deployed for privacy uh, across from, from the data layer all the way up to the application layer. Um, and we see uh, choices shifting over time about what privacy technologies uh, are, are the most appropriate um, from sort of tried and true things like completely off, off chain document exchange um, through to identity masking techniques on chain um, and, and even zero knowledge proofs. So, so very sophisticated uh, math that, that uh, gives um, certain proofs. Um, and then finally, maybe even Brian will, will touch on, but trusted execution environments and some of the communities that, that are evolving there. So an enterprise really has a lot of choices to make uh, for something as, as important uh, as privacy. Uh, and, and this is a, a key part of a design that a consortium needs to solve. So because we have some of the larger communities represented, I wanted to spend one slide on uh, the Ethereum ecosystem and, and talking about what's happened the last 12 months and looking a little bit ahead. Uh, so first the protocol space, um, uh, Hyperledger Basu uh, is, is a project that at Kaleido uh, we, we get a lot of interest in today. It's a, a rapidly evolving uh, project under the Hyperledger umbrella. It's achieved active status. Um, and is backed by our partners at Pegasus. Quorum is also advancing on, is still remains a very popular choice. Um, and, and looking across industry projects, these, these are, are ones that, that we work with directly at Kaleido. There are many more, um, but many key milestones. So what Martha was talking about is we are, we are hitting those production milestones. It, you know, we are not, I agree to, to sort of full scale production and switching off our old systems, but we, we've seen in our network some, for example, Comgo, you know, a billion dollar trans, transacted on their platform. And then finally, um, rounding that out, this, the, our standards, the specs like the EEA spec V5 and the token taxonomy initiative continue to plow forward. And I would have to mention that Ethereum 2.0 is, is a major topic uh, and is something that even we in, in the enterprise space are looking closely at um, and, and see a lot of uh, optimism for going forward in 2020. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brian to talk about, uh, to share some of his perspective. Thank you, Steve, and, and you teed some things up very well, uh, just terrifically for me, and, and thank you, Martha, as well. I'm sorry to be contributing uh, about six of the frameworks of the 70 that you had to uh, analyze there, um, uh, but, uh, but hopefully uh, it, it, I, I, you know, that made it worth it. Um, I, I'm very excited to be speaking here at Consensus. It was after attending Consensus in 2016 in May that I said yes to the offer from the Linux Foundation to go and lead Hyperledger, um, partly because I was so excited about, um, oddly enough, making the blockchain industry boring uh, by uh, uh, trying to operationalize uh, all this excitement and all this kind of new thinking and new, new technology ideas into uh, uh, software infrastructures that enterprise could, enterprises could trust in the way that they had come to start to trust Linux and other open source technologies. Uh, and that trust comes from not just by being open source, right, uh, and by having software that, that where you can see the code and, and run it for free, right? The trust also comes from understanding how the code is built, uh, understanding all the legal T's and C's that surround that collaborative process, and in making sure that these technologies have multiple uh, providers of software and services around them and are actually built by a multi-stakeholder community. Uh, and so four years later, uh, I'd, I dare say we've achieved quite a bit of that goal of uh, perhaps uh, not, not so much to make blockchain industry boring. I think uh, um, some of that has kind of happened on its own, um, but, uh, but really by uh, helping build these, these uh, communities that build these products then building the commercial ecosystem around it. Um, some of you saw the, the Forbes Blockchain 50, um, Hyperledger-based product projects are uh, the majority of those. The majority of those uh, companies that were profiled are using Hyperledger Fabric or Sawtooth or Hyperledger Indie. Um, uh, we're quite confident that that list will uh, soon include Hyperledger Bezu as well. Because uh, the last for the last year, we've seen a lot of progress in the underlying technologies. Um, uh, Hyperledger Bezu, as, as Steve mentioned, came in as a contribution from the Pegasus team, from the broader consensus community. But that was really
really after finding ways for us as communities to work together. Uh, in fact, there's a story today uh, up on uh, Cointelegraph about, uh, 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 sorry, Coindesk, about the collaboration between Ethereum and, and the Hyperledger communities. Um, so really excited to have that energy and that, that, that new capability. Um, and by the way, Bezu works not just for the permission blockchain networks, but for the public uh, blockchain-based networks, the Ethereum one, as well as the Ethereum Classic one, which um, certainly was controversial when it was uh, discussed, but, but really helps demonstrate, we believe that there's this spectrum, right, for blockchain networks uh, that they'll sit on from very private and permission to very public. And we want to make sure that people can move and find solutions anywhere in that spectrum that they'd like. Um, so Bezu coming in, Hyperledger Fabric hitting version 2.0, and in fact, version 2.1 was just released, also shows the continued momentum around the Fabric ecosystem. Uh, lots of new capabilities, new consensus mechanisms, uh, and lots of new deployments to talk about out there as well. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, we also just launched uh, a new project called Hyperledger Cactus. Uh, uh, it was previously uh, kind of percolating in the Hyperledger Labs uh, under the name the Blockchain Integration Framework. Framework. Uh, and it's uh, a, a contribution from uh, Accenture and from Fujitsu, uh, and has already seen contributions from a number of others uh, to try to build a, uh, an interoperability system between two blockchain networks um, so that you can conduct transactions across them. We think pretty much every enterprise of non-trivial size will need to interoperate across multiple different blockchain networks, different protocols. Um, and so coming up with a generalized way to do that that avoids um, going through another central party, right? Just routing through somebody else's central blockchain is pretty important. Um, so Hyperledger Cactus is just getting started. Uh, uh, you'll see more news about that soon. Um, and Hyperledger Labs has become a really nice place for us to grow new ideas and give them space without worrying about overloading them with too much PR or too much process. Um, we've got a project in there now called the eThaler, which is a, um, uh, an, an experiment to applying the uh, token taxonomy framework that came out of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance to central bank digital currencies. Uh, and in fact, uh, Vipin Barathan will be speaking on that, uh, I believe tomorrow morning uh, in a session on um, uh, tokenized CBDCs uh, and the kind of token, the future for tokens, right? I forget the name of the session, um, but, uh, uh, but he'll be speaking more about that then. Um, and as noted, we also had a recent new project join uh, called, uh, uh, to get started called Hyperledger Avalon, which is uh, also an implementation of a, um, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance specification uh, in the trusted computing space, uh, which is about having a generalized framework for using zero knowledge proofs or uh, trusted execution environments inside of uh, chips from say Intel and, and other providers of such um, to try to have that balancing act between a, a common distributed ledger, a common system of record uh, that you can use to verify the provenance of products and that sort of thing, but avoiding creating um, uh, too much information that people can trade against to understand, well, how much flow is going through different business partners, that sort of thing, as an example, right? So lots of exciting stuff happening in the developer community. Um, I, I, and and, and we're, our job is to also make sure that feeds out into the vendor ecosystem and that folks are building businesses on top of this code. Uh, and and so we've seen a lot of expansion in the production blockchain networks out there using Hyperledger technologies. Uh, uh, and, and the COVID-19 thing has certainly uh, caused uh, the whole you know, uh, global economy to kind of catch its breath. Um, but it, it, I absolutely agree with Martha and, and, and others that this is, uh, uh, you know, it's happening at actually a good time for this technology. People have realized the technology works. There's some constraints. There's some places where you want to choose one over another or have certain approaches, but it's becoming kind of bro more broadly understood how and where you would apply these uh, technologies. Uh, and, and so many of the stuff of the, of the networks that were in um, POC two years ago and perhaps pilot last year are really uh, going forth into production this year. And you've heard some of the marquee names, things like the Food Trust Network. Uh, um, uh, but, you know, we've even surfaced a couple of ones that are, are big and, and haven't really gotten a lot of PR. Um, projects like Honeywell's, uh, who are running a, a billion dollar airplane parts marketplace uh, on top of Hyperledger Fabric. Um, 
And then some of these projects are being kind of repositioned to help with the fight against COVID-19. Um, so for example, the, uh, a network uh, called the Trusted Supplier Network built by uh, Chainyard and, and IBM, uh, uh, which has been in operation now in production for over a year, um, kind of serving almost as a KYC service for suppliers in uh, supply chains. That has now taken on the, the providing of personal protective equipment uh, challenge and try, uh, uh, in the fight for COVID, against COVID-19. Um, and so that uh, uh, that's been used now to for in quite a bit of the procurement around those uh, uh, around those th uh, things. There's also a lot of focus now on digital identity. Um, I, I, I and in, in this in this fight with COVID against COVID-19, identity not just for uh, healthcare providers who are crossing state lines to go where the needs are strongest, um, but also now a lot of conversation around immunity passports, um, credentials that can prove you have a an antibodies test, um, or as a vaccine comes out to prove you've been vaccinated to be able to do things like go and work in uh, high touch environments or uh, health sensitive environments. Um, uh, lots of interest, lots of activity um, in uh, building on the technologies and the standards that have come somewhat out of the Hyperledger Indy and Hyperledger Aries community. Um, specific to COVID, you can go and see some of that activity at a site called COVID Creds .com. Um, But uh, uh, we also just launched at the Linux Foundation something called the Trust Over IP Foundation just last week, which builds on these technologies, isn't focused exclusively on COVID, but tries to provide a general infrastructure for the different layers of governance that we'll need to get from the utility networks around identity, things like the Sovereign Foundation, all the way up to, well, how do you get health authorities and uh, workplaces to get back to work by being able to show the right kind of credentialing, uh, I, whether in response to the, the pandemic or, or other types of credentialing needs. Um, so really, I uh, hope that folks check that out as well. And we at Hyperledger, you know, we're part of the Linux Foundation family. So we're seeing a lot of interest in building on top of these technologies in new types of technology governance um, projects and frameworks. So, so the Trust Over IP Foundation is the first of what we think will be a series of such projects going forward. Um, and with that, that's, uh, uh, that's just should I give you a sweep of where Hyperledger is in, in uh, uh, May of 2020. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, I'll try and do my piece in uh, three minutes or less. I did have a, a slide. I don't know if we, if we have it up there. Oh, there you go. Um, so, hello, I'm Todd McDonald. Thanks to everyone for, for prefacing these comments. So, I had, uh, we had an assignment here to, uh, to really get a report from the front line, you know, what are the lessons learned over the last, and for us, four or five years. Uh, so, I had, I had three I wanted to bring forward, and, and luckily, you know, the, the other panelists have already brought these uh, forward as well. <clears throat> um, number one, uh, from a, as a challenge, we have a common enemy, and this is across the entire blockchain space, and that's complexity. Uh, I think uh, Brian was it termed it making blockchain boring, and then Martha had that sort of the the uh, underneath the 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 waterline. Uh, there's complexity that we as an industry really have to uh, address. Number one, and how we talk about uh, this technology, but number two, talking about the technology less. And I think uh, really the big thing is making it easy for those building applications and making it even easier for those to adopt it. Um, so I think we, we have done a lot and others are doing a lot across the industry, but we have more to do to condense that time to value and to reduce complexity. Second is around networks. So blockchain on its own is no fun. You need a network for that. And it's, and it's an amazing bit of software to be able to run networks that are mildly distrusting. But as Martha said, it's, it takes a human touch. You know, from the beginning at R3, we have put in so much time and effort and our partners, I'll talk about a couple, you really have to lean in to get these networks going, number one, and number two, to get that adoption, uh, to really to spur that. It's not just about the technology, as we mentioned before, and it's really, really important. And those first two really go together, lower the complexity to allow for these networks to form and to grow and to prosper. And the last has also been touched on, you know, I'm very excited about digital assets. We have lots of digital asset um, uh, applications and networks that are going live. And what we're starting to see is a demand or a pull for digital payments, or whether that's on-chain payments, things like stable coins, integration to existing payment providers, because you come back to like, what is the point of all this? Is It's to simplify the world for those that are building applications, launching networks and running things. So, you know, I wanted to just mention two examples of, of our partners and applications and networks, networks that are running on top of Corda, uh, that I think are quite helpful because as a very smart friend of mine said, you know, don't let your facts get in the way of my opinion. So we want to bring some of the facts here around 
uh, what's actually out there and being used in production. So two, one, um, in Italy, there's the Spunta project, uh, which is live with, I think, over 30 Italian banks that are live and a quarter enterprise network. And by the end of the year, there'll be 80% of the Italian Banking Association will be live. So this is really important because if you take all these themes we've talked about, number one, you have an infrastructure provider in SIA, uh, and you have uh, NTT data that's helping deliver the application, and you have a governance framework that, that Abby and Abby Labs is, and the Italian Banking Association is putting forward. Because this is bootstrapping an existing ecosystem into a new digital transformation world. And the second one is another one that flies a little bit under the radar, going back to ecosystems, is the blockchain for procure to pay uh, network in Thailand. This is Digital Ventures and Siam Commercial Bank taking their existing sort of vertically integrated supply chain ecosystem and be able to, to launch a supply chain financing network with Siam Cement Company. Um, and at, at the current count, they have uh, 4,000 uh, affiliated corporates within that supply chain financing that are on this network. So these aren't POCs. Uh, these are live implementations, um, and those are just two examples. We have a, a bunch of others, and we, we love all of our partners, um, but there are real things that are happening here. There are challenges we have to work through, so it's, it's up to all of us to, I think, <laughs> focus on how we can help make our customers successful as they move from in a, you know, a paper-based economy into a new digital economy that's being spurred by all the events happening around us. What are the things we can do to try and reduce this time to market uh, condense it to get to value and maybe put that blockchain under the surface and put the solution up front. So that's it for me. And I'm actually going to hand back to Steve for a related uh, announcement before we get to a couple of questions. Thanks, Todd. Uh, apropos. Uh, so, I, you know, today we want to announce a new partnership uh, between Kaleido and R3. Uh, we're really excited to, to make that announcement here live uh, at the consensus conference. Um, and you know what, what this announcement really brings is you know, R3's a, a flagship Corda software onto Kaleido's uh, infrastructure that's where we're already partnered with AWS and Azure and, and run hybrid as well um, on, on a cross cloud uh, stack. So, for, for the quarter user base today, they can go, as of now, it's live on Kaleido. You can spin up uh, your own network and, um, and, and you can get going with all the services that Kaleido has in the box or all the consortium capabilities that we were talking about around B2B collaboration and governance, really critical for success. Digital assets as well going forward. And this is an enterprise grade platform, which I think reflects the maturity of the overall market as well, that solutions like Kaleido now are ISO certified and have disaster recovery built in and key management and all the things that enterprises must have. Um, I'm going to show you real quickly what this looks like to select a set of regions across AWS and Azure, um, create a physical environment now selecting Corda, this is a dev environment. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just uh, create two nodes quickly here. Um, and while the first node is coming up, I'm going to create a second node. Um, because this was created as a development network, we're spinning up all the infrastructure around identity management, uh, establishing credentials. And as those go live now, we can take our core app and we can deploy that through smart contract management onto the appropriate nodes. The one node is on AWS, the other, other one's on Azure with an appropriate security boundary around it. Now that the app's deployed, we can see things like logs and dashboards and, and interact with our infrastructure. I encourage any, mm -hmm. any R3 uh, user that's curious, there is a free plan on Collider to go ahead and try it. Fantastic. So, Thank you, Steve. I, I really appreciate that. Um, Great job. That's yeah. Really exciting uh, announcement, um, and and thank you all for for sharing. I want to I want to jump into a bit of the uh, Q and A portion um, by starting off with uh, kind of uh, we we started off the talk a little bit, Martha, around uh, the this um, pandemic and recession being a time in which uh, we might see a little bit of a trimming of the fat um, uh, in terms of blockchain uh, enterprise uh, projects and kind of moving away from POC and more into production. Uh, I wanted to uh, back to you, Martha, and ask about like what kind of 
uh, projects, if any of you've seen, um, uh, what, what, what kind of projects are succeeding and, and which ones are falling away uh, during this time? Well, if I, I jump in there, I'll pick up on something I've, I've mentioned already. The ones that are succeeding and really succeeding have tend to have um, two of three characteristics. One, they really understand that everybody in the network has to have a benefit from it, from the largest to the smallest participant. Um, <laughs> secondly, they've, they've really um, either got to save money or make money. There has to be commercial sense to the use case as well. And then thirdly, and that's why I'm saying two of three or possibly all three, if they also map onto an element that helps with overall, um, for example, um, removing friction from processes, which of course takes cost out or improve transparency, because, which helps sustainability, um, um, tracking CO2 emissions, whatever it may be, where we will see an increasing focus as well so that's um that's what i'd say um given the time available <laughs> thanks for that martha i'm going to just jump in with a quick question if that's okay um question for so congratulations guys um, um congratulations Kaleido and r3 for collaborating which is a kind of a quite a, 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 a an eyebrow raising sort of announcement in the enterprise blockchain world it's it's very exciting I've, i wanted to ask you a kind of quite direct question to, to do with that um, a wee while ago, we reported on a, a project which is part of a consensus spoke project in the Philippines with, a, with Union Bank, a payment system, and Kaleido quite heavily involved in that. And the question I wanted to ask you three guys is, is, is the future of that project seemed a little bit unclear. Do you think R3 and yourselves might pick up that project and run with it now? I'm sure Todd would love to say yes. Um, Come on, Todd, say yes. <laughs> of course, I always I default to yes. That's what people know about me. So yeah, one hundred percent. Just 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 to be clear, uh, Union Bank was on um, uh, earlier, a few hours earlier, on on a coin desk uh, as part of the distributed conference. Their eye to eye platform is in production. They're actually announcing expansion of that. Um, uh, so so that remittance payment network is is alive and healthy. Um, and that's one of the ones that had does have the business value to justify um, uh, its continued growth. But I just really quickly, Ian. So what's extremely important? It, well, there's a bit, a lot of us that have been in the space for a while. We are just at the beginning of of reaching uh, a wider audience, and so you know having Corda be available on Kaleido is is a step to you know getting all of our uh, our software and these networks available to more and more people, more and more co companies, corporations. Uh, the existing projects, we, we are very focused on helping them be successful, but it's, you know, that's 1% of the, of the market, right? We have the other 99% that we're going out to and we need to make things available. We need to make Corda and other things available in the way that people consume their software. So this is as managed services is on the cloud platforms, we are just at the beginning of that. And I think there's gonna be many, many, many more other opportunities, whether they're consortium based or large corporates trying to, to rationalize processes that we can really go after together. Good, okay, thanks. Um, Nate, have you got questions? Yeah, um, uh, another thing just to pose to the group is uh, from, from the audience, someone is wondering um, if we'll see more convergence and blurring of the lines between permissioned and permissionless uh, blockchain. Did did John Wolpert ask that question? Is he a, he's already? I thought he's on the next panel. Um, <laughs> <I'm so, not laughs> <this>. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So uh, interestingly, so Richard Gunder Brown, who's our, our CTO, and I guess folks would, he's he's very famous in the in this space. He he just put out a piece that's related to this uh, permission versus permissionless. I think it's it's an interesting uh, interesting topic and. A debate, but once again, it's a very insular debate around these sort of implementation uh, choices. If flipping around is like, what what are you, what customers are you trying to reach, and what are those customers trying to solve? Um, I think we all agree, and I've said this on stage before. You know, open networks win, and so I think open public, but having the right permissions and privacy uh, to allow for for uh, enterprises to be able to, to transact uh, securely and safely is the key. Uh, that's the key for us. That's how we've been architecting things from day one. What kind of permissions for that are the most important when it comes to security? 
Well, if you think around, uh, so Brian mentioned, uh, maybe Brian can speak to this as well, but identity and a, and a known identity of those that you're transacting with is an extremely important uh, aspect of this. Yeah, no, it'll, it'll, it's like water finding its own level, right? There'll be some use cases that make a ton of sense. Uh, and I should note, it's not just like one dimension, uh, read, write, it's, there's also reading versus writing, you know, uh, the domain name system, for example, is a public read uh, data set, uh, but it's highly federated in how write permissions are sorted out. Uh, we'll probably see similar models emerge uh, where uh, being able to verify the integrity of transactions is very important, but being able to make anybody be able to stand up their own independent node, perhaps less relevant.